Okay, welcome to this talk on uh, new concurrency utilities in Java 8. Uh, this is a talk for Java programmers. Can I safely assume that you are familiar with concurrent programming in Java? Who is not? Okay, that's good. So, what we will discuss is get an overview of the new concurrency utilities that were added to Java 8. Uh, we will learn about asynchronous result processing. They have been adding a new facility or a new class, the completable future, which is an alternative to the regular future that was added with Java 5. And it's, uh, it's kind of a different way of processing the results that are produced by concurrently running threads. Another abstraction that has been added in Java 8 is stamped lock, which is an alternative lock, and in particular, it's an alternative to the read-write lock that has been available since Java 5. Then there is another addition, namely adders and accumulators. They are similar to atomic long, atomics in general. Um, most of these additions to, to, to the uh, concurrency utilities are ways for providing optimization. So there is barely anything radically new, but most of these new abstractions support optimizations. And I will go into some of the details. Uh, there are a couple of new methods in concurrent hash map. Uh, they have been added actually to the map interface, so even the single-threaded hash map and tree map support new operations. And they are particularly interesting for concurrent hash map because all these additional uh, operations on a hash map are atomic if you use them on a concurrent hash map. Then there is a particular new, well, it's not a new thread pool, it's a singleton fork join thread pool that is used in various contexts. It's used by streams in Java, it's used by completable future, and also by some of the concurrent hash map operations that have been added to the interface. And I will talk about how this common pool, so-called common pool, differs from regular fork join pools. And very low level, so we are working our way from top level abstractions into the deep into the internals of concurrent program. They have been adding a an annotation contended, which is in Java now in Sun Michelinus unsafe. It's very low level, uh, and it is supposed to support avoiding false sharing. Okay, so to add a couple of things to the uh, introduction. Um, I do training for a living most of the time, so I have a couple of uh, seminars. One of them is a seminar on concurrent programming in Java, and this is why I follow uh, what is going on, on, on in, in Java and in the JDK. Okay, let's start with completable future. Future in general is a mechanism for passing a result produced by a concurrently running task to an interested party, another thread typically. And it has been added initially in Java 5, and there is a future interface that describes what future is. Basically, the central operation is get the result. And future task is the implementing class that was added in Java 5. And they were mainly designed for use with thread pools. Let's take a look at the Java 5 way of using futures. What you do in Java 5 is you create a thread pool, then you specify a callable or a runnable, which I've been specifying here as a lambda expression. Then you submit the callable or runnable to the pool, and the pool immediately wraps it into a future task and returns a future. Okay, the task itself is still sitting in the task queue of that pool, and you can use the future, and in particular the futures get function, to wait for the result, to wait for completion of the result. And once you receive the, 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 the result from the get function, the get function, by the way, is a blocking function if the task is still running and the result has not yet been produced. So you wait until the result is available and then you can use it. In my example, I'm simply printing it. What the limitation of this is that you have, as a user of the future, you have to actively decide when you want to retrieve the result. And 
in particular, you might have to wait until the result is available. There is, so far, until Java 8, there was no way of specifying some kind of asynchronous result processing. So you act in, in all cases, you had to actively go and ask for the result. Are you familiar with lambdas? I've been using the lambda without even asking. Who is not familiar with lambda expressions? A uh, few couple. Lambda is basically a new language feature in Java 8, and the yellow part in my submit statement uh, is a lambda. Lambda is basically an anonymous function. And if you look at the syntax, it has the arrow symbol in the middle, and to the what is it? To the left, you have an argument list. It's like the argument list of a method. And to the right, you have the method implementation, like the body of a method. And it's um, some kind of anonymous method. Yeah, it doesn't have a name. It just has an argument list and an implementation. And that's it. Yeah? And in my example, I am providing a callable to the submit function of my pool. So the lambda, magically, uh, somehow implements the callable interface. And basically, it corresponds to what we've usually been doing with anonymous in our classes. Yeah? So the lambda is some kind of concise notation for things that we've been solving previously uh, with anonymous in our classes. Okay, I've been using them, all well, the new, or many of the new uh, APIs in Java 8 use the new feature, so I will, throughout the talk, use lambdas in various places. Okay, so the limitation of the classic future is no support for, for some kind of reactive result processing. What we actually were missing is that we can specify some kind of, of callback function, some kind of functionality that will be executed as soon as the result becomes available. Asynchronous result processing. And this is what the completable future provides. Completable future is a class in the Java Util concurrent package. And it combines the classic future interface, so, so you can use a completable future like a future task and just use the blocking get function in order to retrieve the result, but it also implements a new interface called completion stage. And completion stage has a couple of dozens of functions, uh, many of them for asynchronous result retrieval, like in the example here. So let's assume that I've been Receiving a completable future, I will go into how you can retrieve completable futures in a minute. And once I have a completable future, I can use the get function and wait for the result. But alternatively, I can use the then accept function. And what I'm specifying there is a functionality that will be executed as soon as the result is produced. Yeah? And I don't have to wait. The then accept function just hands over functionality, and then the thread that is producing the result, yeah, is executing the task and producing the result, will subsequently call my lambda that I've been providing to the then accept function as, a, as the argument. And basically what I'm doing is, once the result is available, then please print it. So I do not have to wait. Yeah, I just make available some kind of functionality that will be executed exactly when the result becomes available and it is executed asynchronously in a different thread. So I don't have to wait. I don't have to blindly recheck until the result becomes available. I just specify ahead of time what will be done once the, re the result becomes available. Okay, I've, I've been leaving open where I got that completable future from. And completable futures are also created by passing tasks, runnables or kind of callables, to a pool. But it is not done by uh, using the pool specifically and calling a submit or execute function. Instead, the completable future has static factory functions or factory methods to which you supply your task and then it returns a completable future. And there are two different flavors of well, these static factory methods. One is for runnables, and these methods are called run async and run async with an executor, so you can specify in which pool the runnable will be executed. If you do not specify a pool yourself, then the fork join common pool is used, which I will go into in a minute later. Okay, so you can pass over runnables. What is returned is a completable future of void. 
runnables do not produce a result, and so what you can specify a reaction to would be the completion of the runnable without receiving or processing any result. If you have a result-producing task, which traditionally we have been expressing as a callable, you would call supply async and pass in an implementation of the supplier interface. The supplier interface is a new interface and it was uh, added in conjunction with the streams that are also part of the uh, Java 8 JDK. And there is a new package called Java Util Function and it has a couple of predefined functional interfaces uh, that are typically used as the argument types of stream operations or like in this example, uh, it is used as the argument type of the supply async function. And a supplier, the supplier interface is a functional interface. Functional interfaces have one, only one abstract method. And the abstract method, a supplier doesn't take anything as an argument, but produces or supplies a result. And in this case, this is similar to a callable. Remember callables? Callables don't take arguments, but they produce a, re a result. The difference between a callable and a supplier is, if you remember the callable, its call method is allowed to throw checked exceptions, in particular an execution exception. And uh, all the APIs that are using lambdas have difficulties with checked exceptions. So nowadays all the lambdas uh, are typically free of checked exceptions. And so the supplier has a function that takes no argument, produces a result, but doesn't throw any checked exceptions. So basically, it's an exception-free callable. So you have these two flavors here of passing a task to either the fork join common pool or a pool of your choice. And then what is returned is a completable future, which allows you to use the traditional synchronous get function, so the, the classic future interface, or the completion stage functions like then async or then accept. And there are several other functions that allow to specify reactions to the result retrieval. Okay, so comparing the, the, the options, this is the old way of doing it. Yeah, you actively use the future and decide, now I want to wait for the result. And then you get the result and process it in some way. And the reactive way using completable future is, I start the task or pass it to some pool and then immediately afterwards, I receive the future and then I specify the reaction that is executed upon result, uh, the event that the result becomes available. Okay. The completable future, like, well, quite a number of new APIs that were added to the JDK with Java 8, uh, uses the so-called fluent programming style. And fluent programming means that you have an API in which almost all operations um, return an object on which you can perform the next operation in a chain of operations. So each operation returns something on which you can execute the next operation. And I've been using an example here. You can have short sequences of operations or some kind of lengthy operation. Like the lower part here, I'm s supplying a callable to some kind of pool. The callable calls a get stock info method that uh, somehow retrieves, uh, given uh, a stock symbol, it retrieves a string that contains information about the stock. When complete, so once that, that string has been produced, when complete, I just print what has been retrieved as the result. And when complete also returns a completable future on which I can call the next operation and then I, then I say, apply an extract increase rate method to the result of the get stock info stuff. And then it extracts some kind of double the increase rate, let's say. Once the increase rate is produced, now that's also a completable future containing a double, I call it then accept function. And then I format the result, the increase rate, and print it. And afterwards, I have some kind of termination method, which is the then run. And then run is one of the methods that do no longer return a completable future. So that's kind of the end of my sequence. Hmm? Question? Yes? Supply, does supply async run the task? No, supply async just passes the task to a thread pool. 
Yeah, it's like submit or execute with the traditional thread pools. It just passed to the pool, the pool puts it into, into some kind of task queue, and there it sits until a thread is available to execute it. So this is not a blocking function. Yeah? You just pass over the task and it returns the future immediately. Ah, could the task finish before I specify then accept? In theory, yes. So if the pool, if a thread in the pool is available and executes it immediately and it takes only nanoseconds to proceed, well then the result would be become available immediately. And then immediately afterwards all the, the reactions would be executed. So the f completable future handles this case in particular. So it need not take time, not necessarily, okay? But usually, I mean, you pass on tasks to a thread pool that typically takes some time, yeah? So it usually you are finished with providing all the reactions before the task even runs, typically. Okay. So what's the big deal with, with this kind of reactive style? I mean, it, it, it provides higher scalability. Because with a traditional way of retrieving the result, you typically, you have to wait. Yeah? And you're wasting time just waiting for the result. Or you can wait with a time out, which is basically polling. And then you, you waste resources for, for the blind rechecks, the many rechecks, until you actually receive the result. And uh, with the completable future, you wouldn't, you wouldn't waste any time. You do not have to recheck, you don't have to wait, you just specify what kind of reaction is executed right at the moment when the result becomes available. It's, it's basically like providing a callback that is invoked upon the event of result completion. Okay. The first time I looked at the interface, I was overwhelmed because it has three or four dozen methods, so there are lots of operations. Um, most of them are for so-called result users. And there are methods that stem from the classic future interface. They've been adding a couple of logical extensions to the classic future interface. Then we have the factories like supply async and run async that I've been showing you. Then it has all the completion stage function for providing reactions. And then it has bulk operations like do something after all these futures complete or any of these futures complete. So it has a really fat interface, I think. Okay, a couple of more details. There is not only a then accept function for specifying reactions, but there are three different functions. You, after, after you've been receiving a completable future, you can say then apply a function, then accept a consumer, or then run a runnable. The difference basically is, let's say, let's take then accept, it takes a consumer, and a consumer is something that takes the result, somehow consumes it, processes it, and doesn't return anything. So the result would be a completable future of void. If you use then apply, you have to provide a function, and a function is something that takes the result and produces a new result or something else. It kind of maps the result to some kind of new object or information. So it returns a completable, it takes a T and returns a completable future for a U. So that's kind of a mapping function. And then run takes a runnable, and as you know, runnables don't take anything, don't return anything, that's just like, I want to react upon completion without receiving the result, without doing anything with it, and I don't return anything. So it returns a completable future of void. So there are these three different flavors of providing a reaction, and each of these three exists in three different flavors which makes for the FAT API, yeah, the, the combination is already in nine different functions. The different three flavors here using the example of then run is then run the runnable, the reaction, synchronously, asynchronously, or asynchronously with a specific pool of my choice. Hmm? And basically what the difference is, if you say then run synchronously, then the thread, typically a pool thread, that has been producing the result will also uh, execute the runnable that I've been providing. And if you say then run async, another pool thread, a new pool thread, a different pool thread, would execute the runnable. So one thread would execute the task, produce the initial result, and then a runnable will be started in a different thread. 
And you can even start the runnable in a different thread in a different pool if you want. Okay, so you have nine different functions for providing various reactions in various flavors. Then there are more functions like for combinations. Yeah, if you want to react upon the completion of two different futures, there is a then combine function. Uh, example here, I supply a callable, a uh, kind of a callable, that is called get a stock symbol's uh, daily lowest rate and another one for the highest rate. So I have two futures for different executions of two different tasks and two different results. And I want to do something on completion of both. So I take one of the futures, say then combine with the other future and a reaction that takes both results and produces something new. In my example, I just calculate the difference of daily low and daily high. And then the result again is a completable future of double in my case probably, and then I apply a formatting function that prints it. Yeah. So you can have combinations of futures and react on, upon the completion of several things. Yes? Can you combine more than two futures? Yes, you can combine more than two futures. There is an all of function to which you supply a collection of uh, suppliers or runnables, and then you would react on the completion of all of them. And there's also an any of function. Okay, this is kind of an overview of the dozens of functions. Yeah, you have the factory methods, supply async, run async, with a pool and with a, without a pool, so in different flavors, each of them. Um, then you have the then apply, then accept, then run things in three flavors, yet another nine functions for specifying reactions. Then you have functions for specifying reactions upon failure, yeah? So, when complete, handle, and exceptionally. Exceptionally is called if the task throws a runtime exception. Handle uh, receives both the result if it was successful and uh, the exception if it was, well, if it failed, yeah? And then it can produce a reaction. Handle can produce a replacement result, while when complete doesn't return a result. It just takes the result in case of success, the exception in case of failure, and then produces some kind of reaction. Uh, then there is a pipeline, then compose. Hmm, interestingly, this is basically uh, the flat map, some kind of flat map operation. If you've been looking into the stream interface, there is a flat map function, and this is basically what the, the corresponding thing for the uh, completable future. And then there are combinations, then combine, then accept both, run after both, various flavors of combining two futures, and then there is the all of and any of for more than two futures. So this is the completion stage reactive interface of completable future. And then it supports the traditional future stuff like get and cancel and is done. And they have kind of logical extensions of the future. There is a get now that returns immediately if the result is available. So far, if you just wanted to poll, you had to call get with a timeout, a very short timeout. And now you have a get now function that returns immediately. And, and you have a join function, which is basically a get function without a checked exception. Hmm? So it, it, it wraps the exception if the task failed into a runtime exception instead of a checked execution exception. Otherwise, it's just like the get function. Cancel is funny. I will get into this into a mini, in, into a minute. It's just supported because the future interface always had a cancel function. Okay, then there is another part of the API which I call the hmm, result provider API. And this is for people who want to return completable futures from their own functions. So what we've been looking into so far is, well, somebody provides us with a completable future and I want to use the completable future in order to specify all my reactions. But I could also be a result provider myself. So I'm providing an API which returns a completable future to something. So I am providing completable futures to users of my API. And then what I will be doing is I must provide a future which is initially empty, and then I have to make provisions that the result is computed and that the future is completed as soon as the result becomes available. And what does that look like? Let's say I want to implement a get web page function. Yeah? It receives a URL, 
and then it is supposed to provide the content of that web page as a string. And since it takes time yeah, to access the URL and read all the content and stuff it into a string, I want to provide a completable future so that the user of my get web page function doesn't have to wait. Yeah? I could implement it and just have the user wait until the string becomes available, then my get web page function would return string, but that would be a blocking function that takes a long time. And if I want to make it more convenient for my users, I say, okay, I provide you with a completion stage. Let's say this is basically a completable future to a string. And then you can specify all your reactions without waiting for the completion of the result. And inside that function, I would have to create an empty yet incomplete future. Then I have to set up, well, somehow the result calculation, which must be set up in a way that eventually it completes the future. And then I return the future even before the result exists, yeah, so that the user can already start specifying all the reactions. In source code, it looks like this. This is my get web page function. It returns a completable stage, a completable future or a completion stage of the string. I create an empty completable future, which is calling the constructor. Then I set up the result computation. So I set up a runnable that calls a blocking read page function, yeah, and that blocks, that takes a long time. Once it is done, yeah, and returns with the content of the web page as a string. I must make sure that the runnable, as its last action, uh, completes the future. And there is a complete function. Future has a complete function for exactly this purpose. And then it stuffs the result of blocking read into the future. Yeah? And if it fails, there is a complete exceptionally where you can pass in the exception. And then you have to make provisions that this task, this runnable, is executed. So I pass it to some kind of pool. Yeah, and then I return the empty future. So far, I've just been setting up the runnable, been passing it to a fool. Task is probably not yet running, and I return the empty future to my user, and the user can take the future and stuff in or specify all the reactions to the completion of this future. Okay? So this is if you want to design interfaces that return completable futures. In that sense, you would be a result producer instead of a result user. Okay, and there are these two functions, complete and complete exceptionally for completing a yet empty future. Okay, so if you compare future tasks, the Java 5 way of, of implementing futures and completable future, there's one key difference. Future task is actually a combination of future and a task. It knows the task that uh, it, it knows the task which produces the result. Yeah? Whereas the completable future decouples the, the handover mechanism of, of what is the, the future characteristics and the task execution. Completable future doesn't know anything of the task that executes and produces the result. Yeah? Which makes for funny results because, I mean, with future tasks, the cancel function made sense because you could cancel the task while it was running. Completable future has a cancel function and you can call it, but the result is just that the, the future would return exceptionally and the task is still running and producing the result. So since it doesn't know the task, cancel is kind of debatable. Yeah? So I wouldn't use it. Usually, if you use the reactive style and the, the fluent programming style, it would never occur to you, you to call cancel in the first place. Yeah? I have a question. Uh, does it set the interruptible flag on the other thread? Uh, interrupts it the running uh, thread that is executing the task? You mean if I call cancel on a completable future, does it interrupt the task? No, it doesn't, because it doesn't know the task. The task is just alive and running and keeps on doing until it finishes by itself and nobody's interested in the result any longer. It's a bad idea to call cancel, I would say. <laughs> but, but I could um, override the cancel and implement the cancellation in the pool of Yeah, you can certainly derive from the completable future task, override cancel with whatever semantics deems reasonable to you, that is certainly doable, yeah. But the default implementation just r finishes uh, or completes the future exceptionally, yeah, and that's it. Okay. Good. Any further questions regarding completable future?
Otherwise, I'm moving on to the next abstraction. The next one is stamped lock. Stamped lock, as I said, is an alternative to the re-entrant read-write lock. The idea of the classic Java 5 re-entrant read-write lock is it wants to allow concurrent execution of readers and only wants to synchronize the combination of reading threads and writing threads or writing threads with other writers. Yeah? If you have several read accesses, concurrent read accesses to the data structures, that doesn't need synchronization. But if you use the regular re-entrant lock or the synchronized blocks, you would also block, or readers would be blocking other readers. And in order to avoid this non-necessary uh, synchronization of one reader with another reader, re-entrant read-write lock just has a mode in which several readers can access the data, writers are blocked, yeah, and otherwise it blocks the combination of two writers and readers and writers. But readers alone can run in parallel. And the stamped lock is some kind of an extension to it, or it's very similar. The stamped lock internally consists of a version number, the stamp, that, that provides this, or as part of the name, and the internal mode, whether the stamped lock is in read-write, mode-write, or an optimistic uh, mode, an optimistic read mode. This is what makes the difference between the re-entrant read-write lock, which is always a pessimistic lock. Pessimistic means um, I want to acquire the lock, and I want to be sure that, there, that I have, for instance, if I acquire the write lock, I want to make sure that I have exclusive access to the data. No other writer, no other reader can run. This is what I expect of a pessimistic lock. Similarly, if I acquire a pessimistic read lock, then I want to make sure that only readers are running and no writer is running. And what the stamped lock provides is an optimistic read mode. And this allows for optimizations in low contention, low contention situations where there are only very few threads and there's hardly any concurrent uh, access to the data. And then I want to try to read the data without actually acquiring the log. I, just, I just hope for the best yeah, in an optimistic mode. I read the data, grab it, but I cannot be sure that I really had exclusive access to it. I have to validate afterwards and make sure that there was no concurrent access, that the opt my optimistic approach was justified. And this optimistic approach has exhibits better performance unless it fails, yeah? Let's see. So internally, it maintains a stamp each time you acquire a lock, a stamp is, is presented to you and you need to keep that stamp until you unlock or release the lock. And if the stamp is zero, it means uh, you didn't receive the lock, so the acquisition failed. Okay, and then it has the write mode, which is a pessimistic write mode, like with a re-entrant lock. It makes sure that the, the thread that acquires the stamped lock in write mode is the only one, the only thread, and it has exclusive access to the data. Okay, in that mode, if there's one thread in write mode, then no readers can run. Uh, every attempt to acquire an optimistic read lock will fail. Yeah, it really guarantees exclusive access to the data. Then we have the read mode. That's the same read mode with, with like that we have with the re-entrant read-write lock. It allows non-exclusive access because you can have parallelly running writer, readers. The writers are blocked, but readers can run in parallel. So you don't have exclusive access because you are just reading the data and other threads are also allowed to read the data concurrently. This is exactly like with re-entrant read-write lock. And then there is this optimistic read mode. And the optimistic read mode is an extremely weak version of a read lock. I'm just saying, okay, I will try an optimistic read, and afterwards I will simply read, yeah, no matter whether there is concurrent access or not. And after reading, I will ask, was there a concurrent access in between the time when I announced I will read and until I ask whether it was valid? And the optimistic read mode can be broken at any time. So if there is one thread saying, okay, I'm optimistically reading, other readers can join, which is not a problem, but also other writers can join and modify the data that the optimistically reading thread is currently reading. And in that case, you're probably reading inconsistent data, half modified, half not. Yeah? So you must validate afterwards. 
Let's take a look at an example. Okay, this example is classic re-enter and read-write lock, yeah? Pessimistic locking, you have data, you want to synchronize it by using a read-write lock, and the idea is you use the write lock part for all modifying functions and the read lock part for all read-only functions. That's the classic way of doing it, pessimistic read and write lock. You can do the same with the stamped lock. It looks slightly different. Yeah, you create a stamped lock each time you acquire a lock. Yeah, you would acquire a write lock and a read lock. You receive a stamp and you need to use the stamp and pass it to the corresponding unlock function. Otherwise, it's exactly the same as re-enter and read-write lock. The new stuff comes into place when I want to try an optimistic read. Yeah, an optimistic read is for predominantly for short read sequences of read access to the data. That should be very short code segments because the longer it takes to read the data, um, the more likely it is that there is concurrent write access in between and that you will fail eventually. Okay, so this is what it looks like. My data consists of two integers, primitive type integers, part one and part two. I have a stamped lock and now I want to read optimistically. So I say try optimistic read. Thereby, I'm, I'm announcing, okay, I will try an optimistic read and I will later call a validate function and then please tell me whether there was a concurrent write access in between. So I read the two integers, which is a very short code segment of reading, and then I validate. Then I ask, was there, while I was reading, was there some kind of concurrent write access? If so, the data can be inconsistent. Yeah, you might have been reading one integer before the modification and the other one afterwards and you have inconsistent data which is useless. So the validation can fail. If it succeeds, yeah, then you can just use your local integers and calculate them and take, take your time because now you're working on local copies of the actually interesting data. If it fails, yeah, there could have been concurrent write access in between and validate would tell you false, it failed, there was concurrent access then you can, yeah, you need to produce some kind of reaction. One thing you can do is a retry. You could spin in a loop and retry until you eventually succeed, or you can fall back to pessimistic locking, which is what I'm doing here. As soon as the validation fails, that, which is basically the message, okay, there are concurrent writers, your data is inconsistent, I acquire the pessimistic read lock. And acquiring the pessimistic read lock means I am waiting until all writers are gone. Yeah, and then I get, well, the guarantee that only readers will be active while I am reading part one and part two of the interesting data. And afterwards you have to unlock the read lock and then I can, again, calculate whatever I want to calculate based on the data. Yeah? Ah, five minutes left. Mm, okay. That much about stamped lock. It also has optimistic uh, upgrade techniques. Yeah, if you want to upgrade from a read lock to a, to a write lock, that's also a difference to the uh, regular re-entrant read-write lock. Accumulators. Oh, accumulators are not not extremely interesting. It's basically an alternative to the atomic lock. With atomics, you know, atomics are used for block-free programming. You wouldn't use any kind of locks in order to get exclusive access to a long value, for instance, but instead you would be using an atomic lock, and using atomic always means um, you are reading the current value with just one atomic operation, then you calculate a new value based on the previous value, and while you're calculating, there could be, again, concurrent write access to the data that you've been reading. And in order to doing some kind, similar to the validate that we just had, you will be doing a compare and swap operation. And compare and swap means, okay, if there is still the previous old value, then please overwrite it with a new value. And if the old value isn't there anymore, then there was concurrent write access, then it fails and tells you. Yeah, and in, typically with an atomic long, the reaction to failure is retry. Retry, spin in a loop until you succeed. Atomic longs are thread safe and used for lock-free programming, lock-free access to a long, for instance. There's one problem with the atomic long, let's say there is room for optimizations, which the long adder uh, provides. If you have very many threads accessing the atomic long, then they will fail very often and they will spin quite a while in a loop until they succeed. And in order to avoid these retry uh, latency, 
they provided the long adder, and the long adder doesn't uh, maintain a single long, which is concurrently accessed, but it has several atomic cells. So it splits up the actual content, the actual long value, into various longs. So if one thread wants to add something to the atomic long or the long adder, um, and one of the cells is, current, is under concurrent access, yeah, just one of the uncontented cells is updated. So that basically the, the, the entire result isn't produced until you actually ask for the content of the long adder. So basically it tries to reduce contention and failure, excess failure, by splitting it up into different cells. Yeah? So that one thread just adds the value to an uncontented cell and only if you retrieve the result, the actual long value is calculated. So you have add, increment, and decrement functions that don't return anything, which is different from atomic long. Atomic long has a get and increment function. It returns the value. And this one doesn't return the value until you ask, give me the sum. Yeah? And then it adds up all the, all the cells. This is the long adder. The double adder is the same thing. And the accumulators are just a um, generalization. Uh, you can provide an accumulation function that need not be calculating the sum. Yeah, you could calculate the product or whatever else, uh, uh, whatever different kind of accumulation you want to do. Okay, concurrent hash map has a lot of interesting extensions. You can look into, yeah, the concurrent hash map has been reorganized internally. The buckets are no longer lists, but they are trees if the key type is comparable, which is basically an optimization for key types that have poor hash functions. So that's an internal thing, and then it has additional functions. And these additional functions exist in the regular map interface. So for instance, you have a compute function. And the compute function um, will calculate the key and the value. You provide a function that can calculate the value for a given key. So you do not provide the key and the value, you provide the key and a function that calculates the value. And there are compute if absent, compute if present functions. And there is an example here where I'm using compute if absent. Given a list of strings, I want to produce a hash map, a concurrent hash map, that associates to each, each string the frequency in which it appears in my list of strings. Hmm? Okay, so I create a concurrent hash map of string and long adder, the counter, the, the frequency counter, and then I loop over all the strings in my list of strings, and then I compute if absent. Yeah? So if I found a string, yeah? if that string has not yet been added as a key in, into the map, I would calculate the first value, the initial value, which is a, a new long adder. Yeah? Long adder, so far, is initialized with zero value, and the new value is returned from compute if absent. So I, I produce, if the word appears for the first time, I produce a key value pair with a string and a new long adder that contains zero. The long adder is returned and I increment it. The next time the word appears, it's no longer absent, yeah? And then just the associated value is returned and I increment. And this way the result is a list of words and a word counter. And all these op operations are atomic with a concurrent hash map, guaranteed to be atomic. The side, or let's say one of the requirements is that your remapping functions do not take a long time, yeah? otherwise they would be blocking access to certain segments of the hash map. And there is more of this, a merge function, yeah? there are for each search and reduce functions in four flavors, so 12 additional new methods, all atomic, methods in a concurrent hash map. Okay, let's skip a couple of details. The common pool. I already mentioned there is a common pool that is used in all cases where, do not, where you do not provide an explicit pool, like for if you, if you supply a runnable to the completable future, for instance. Or the streams, they also use the common pool. And that's a singleton fork join pool. One single fork join pool, a static fork join pool that is pre configured, yeah, there is only one for all the stream operations, for all the cases in which you need a pool, but do not specify one yourself. Yeah? Um, 
it differs from a regular fork join pool by a lazy initialization, so it starts with no thread and then builds up a number of threads and reduces the number of threads if they are no longer needed. Uh, it has a default pre-configured size, which is available processes minus one. Yeah? There are system properties you can change that value, so you can change the size of the pool. And the shutdown behavior is different. It's basically a pool of daemon threads, so as soon as the last user thread terminates, all the pool threads are automatically terminated, which can produce certain problems. So if you've been passing tasks to, let's say, a completable future or a stream operation, yeah, and you would actually still be needing the common pool, but the last user thread exits, then the pool is shut down automatically and your tasks will no longer be executed. So that requires some kind of, of measurements, uh, you have to wait until the pool has been executed, all the tasks that you pass to it before actually the last user thread executes. There is an await quiescent function for doing exactly this. It waits for an empty pool, no tasks, all threads are idle, nothing to do, yeah, then you can await this particular state of, of the pool and then terminate. Do I still have time for contended? Like two minutes. Two minutes for contended. Okay, two minutes for contended. Content is very, very low level. Uh, it actually addresses false sharing, and false sharing means, I mean, you know the, the hardware architecture of, of multi-core CPU, they, use, they heavily use caches, cores, caches that are uh, linked to a certain core, and you, often you have hierarchical caches, and the idea is uh, if an object, I mean, if, if objects or data is placed into the cache and one thread modifies the cache and other threads want to see the modification, there must be flash, flushes and refreshes into main memory. This is what uh, the memory model of Java is about. Hmm? And there are memory model rules for synchronization and for volatile and, and for, for um, final fields also have rules, which is fine. But you can run into the, the following problem. Typically, if you have a class, like my point class here, it has two integer fields. What the uh, compiler tries to do is to pack all the contents of an object densely together yeah, in order to save space you know, and to save memory. So the entire object with both integers would end up in the same cache line of, of a given core. Okay, if one of the two fields is a hot field, let's say it's a volatile field and it needs, it has concurrent access and it needs many flushes and refreshes, then typically the entire cache line becomes hot. If, if one bit or one integer inside that cache line uh, needs flushes and refreshes, what the hardware does, it flushes and refreshes the entire, the entire uh, cache line. Each time it is accessed, even if it is accessed on a cold field. Yeah? The cold field doesn't even need the, the flushes and refreshes, but the entire cache line, yeah? because there is a volatile or hot field in it, the entire cache line is updated and flushed and refreshed all of the time. So if one of the fields is a hot one, a volatile one, yeah? it triggers flushing and refreshing each time anything in that cache line is accessed. And that is a performance impediment, yeah? The, the caching is supposed to boost the performance, and you're doing quite the opposite if you have cold fields and hot fields in the same cache line. And what the contended uh, annotation is trying to do, uh, it tries to separate cold fields from hot fields, yeah? So you can mark the hot stuff with the contended annotation, and then what the JVM does is it inserts padding bytes in order to make sure that the cold fields are in one cache line, if they are accessed, no flushing and refreshing is necessary, and the hot field sits in another cache line, and each time it is accessed, then all the necessary flushing and refreshing is done. But it is done only then, only if I access the hot field. And contented comes in different flavors for single fields, for groups, for entire objects, all fields of an object. It's very, very low level. Uh, if you don't know what to do with it, then probably you don't need it. Yeah? It's used inside the JDK implementations. For instance, if you look into the fork join pool, in a fork join pool, every thread has its own work queue, and the work queue should be thread specific. Yeah? And it is a contended class, yeah? so that you don't have false sharing because there are several work queues in the same cache line, and you would create flushing and refreshing no matter which thread accesses which queue. Okay, that's an example. Okay, any questions? 
So first of all, thank you. Um, okay. We already have some uh, questions online. Okay. Um, since we already took some from the audience during the talk, I would like to take this one. Um, so one question is, is no, in the example with the new lock, do the fields should be volatile or should the field be volatile? Uh. In the example with the new lock, should the fields be volatile? Uh, that's probably addressing the stamped lock. In the example with stamped lock, no, if you use the stamped lock, the fields need not be volatile because the lock, it's a lock. Yeah? Every lock makes sure that there are flushes and refreshes that uh, guarantee visibility of the modifications that are done under the protection of the lock. So they need not be volatile. Okay. okay? We have another question with, which formally uh, is a question, but I don't think you can answer it. It's more like directed to Oracle. Um, so maybe one more question from the audience. Last one. Ah, OK. Uh, I have learned that uh, using classes from the Sun package uh, is a big no-go. Uh, right. How official is this uh, annotation? It is official. It's an official part of the Oracle JDK. Yeah, and if you need it, if you build low-level abstractions, uh, people are using it. Uh, but it's not for everyday programming. So it is official, but most likely you will not need it in most cases. So it's basically part or it's provided for the library implementers or other people who build libraries or frameworks of their own. So it's official, but yeah, still you shouldn't be using it. Okay? Okay, thank you very much. Okay. In, lots of interesting insights into uh, new stuff in Java 8, which was kind of drowned in the noise generated by Lambdas. Um, okay. Hope to see you in a few minutes for our last talk for today. Okay, thank you. <laughs>